first people dealing with viruses in Hungary, and he's going to describe the ancient history of virology here. Hi there. And I'm really one of the old guys mentioned here. Um, my story doesn't reach as far back as uh, Pisti Sobol's a uh, few moments ago, but I think a lot of time has gone by in this field, and that a lot of time means that we began 22 years ago, approximately. The very first virus reached our hands in the autumn of 1988, and I'm not giving you a big secret, but I used to be a military officer at the time, and I was part of the IT division of the military. We were in charge of the Budapest and the surrounding regions, uh, computers, and there were mainframes. R55, as my friend Loyosh mentioned. But we had lots and lots of PC category machines to repair as well. I wonder if you can imagine the situation. Let's say a lady calls in and tells us, listen, guys, the letters have begun to fall off the computer screen. And, you know, we opened our eyes very big and we said that this was impossible. And the service van drove off to fetch the computer, and we began to test it, and lo and behold, letters truly were falling off. The fact that there might be a virus somewhere out there in the world, well, that was hearsay. We had heard about it, but we had not seen any. That was the early autumn of 1988, and by the end of the year, if I remember well, we had three active viruses alive and kicking. And we were in a pinch. It was very embarrassing, because I wonder if you know what the COCOM uh, list was. It was a very strictly enforced uh, ban on the delivery of IT equipment, including PCs, to the Eastern Bloc along with the operating system. And obviously, various components reached the country. Many computers came in, and these were 8286 category machines. And they were obviously not subject to uh, the original IBM copyright, because IBM strictly enforced these rules, but other vendors did not. So we had other vendors supplying Hungary and the Hungarian military. And the letter drop-off virus looked at the bias, checked the IBM copyright, uh, which, of course, is still inside the IBM original equipment. And if the copyright was found, uh, it just quit out of the computer. And if it didn't find the copyright, the letters began to fall off. Let me just add to the COCOM list, list that it wasn't just a ban on the delivery of electronic equipment, but also a ban on documentation. So in Cascade 1701, we began to do this with our documentation. We knew nothing about the bias or just a few published functions of DOS, and of course the virus wasn't using those, otherwise it wouldn't have been a virus to begin with. So we had nothing to rely on, and two colleagues and I cracked the cascade virus using machine code manually. So we reversed, uh, reverse engineered the code to crack it. and. The first breakthrough occurred at the following date, February 1989, with the reboot virus. It was a simple virus. It kept rebooting uh, the machine. Just a bit later, toward the end of the year, we had Friday the 13th panic day. 
and we were prepared in many ways and we had a major software based background for finding it and we believed that we were doing the right thing and we would actually remove and kill the virus but neither the news nor the faith uh, reached the appropriate quarters because believe me when I say that it was incredibly hard to convince people that indeed there is such a thing as a computer virus. The, the truth is, speaking of stories, imagine this. The phone rings, and there's a female doctor who introduces herself at the other end, and she's very pushy and trying to convince us that she has access to everything. She can even access an electron microscope, and let's take the machine to her, and she will inspect it. And I swear to you that this was the case, because people had a very high time digesting the potential existence of intelligence that can reproduce itself and do similar damage to biological viruses. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to make people understand that this thing was really out there and threatening. About a year went by and we had about 200 living viruses. A living virus, in my examples, always means that we have a copy of the virus and we can make it work, bring it to life, in other words. And, you know, we were depressed by this lack of belief in the idea. I only made one phone call to a radio show in all my life, but they were explaining to the public that there was no such thing as a computer virus, and people believed that there indeed wasn't. And we had a floppy disk that's worth of viruses. So I could tell the guy that, believe you me, uh, Mr. Reporter, that uh, if I gave you this floppy diskette and you inserted it in your computer, it would never ever work again. Now the first book was released, the first in all of Eastern Europe, trying to uh, provide an overview of uh, computer viruses and all we knew about them. Unfortunately, due to the pressure exerted by the publishing house and due to other influences, to put it in a simple way, unfortunately we couldn't publish a good description of the code or how people were making viruses because, well, the powers that be at the time would not allow us. And yet, a description of about 85 viruses could be included in the book, and uh, we developed a typology. We classified the viruses in the different categories, so 85 viruses explained in detail. We described in the book how you could scan the computer and how you could detect a virus, how you could immunize the machine. And the purpose of me and the co-authors, of course, wasn't just to show off and start bragging. And of course, we would provide a description of working antivirus programs that could scan and remove um, the viruses from uh, computers. And I should also mention my colleagues, Gabor Endredi, whose name you could see in the previous list. He was with us from the outset, and Janusz Kisch from Seged. was helping us writing the descriptions and uh, uh, Imre was helping us um, to develop the scanner systems and so on. 
and the competition a few years after us also came on board and uh, Dr. Leitold Ferenc developed Czechvir and uh, Gabor Sopanos developed Virus Buster and uh, still maintain it uh, with a team and Peter Sur on behalf of Symantec is a great developer uh, today and he wrote a book that was published about five years ago in the US on this topic. So that was the fabled uh, past. And now I'm going to attempt something no living soul has ever attempted in public, at least. Not that I'm aware. I'd like to tell you why we changed tack, why we changed our philosophy. And everyone is still pursuing a certain approach, and we diverted our path away from it. Just think about this. By the end of 91, we knew about 1,500 uh, viruses, and we had about 1,200 of them cracked. And evolution, or development, if you can use that word to talk about man-made uh, programs, algorithms, uh, evolution was incredible. However, most viruses were not original creations. So instead of Friday 13th, they would say uh, Tuesday the 8th. So they would just take an algorithm and um, hijack it. By uh, June 23rd, uh, when we were writing uh, this book with the colleagues, uh, we had about a thousand uh, viruses coming to life, and uh, we had a hard time keeping track of them, uh, cracking them, and finding it inside their uh, mutations. Um, the ingenious author would alter the content somewhere, but we didn't have enough time to find out where. What, uh so we, we should handle this situation and implement this situation uh, in an up-to-date way. Belehetetlen. Gondoljátok meg, nincs internet, nincs egy web server, ahova be lehet jelentkezni, vagy egy bármilyen server, ahova be lehet jelentkezni, és letölthetem saját frissítéseimet. Aki ezt... So those who, who ask for it, bought it, uh, and it doesn't matter which kind of software it is, from this, it followed that uh, somebody always uh, ran into problems because uh, those who received it first, uh, we get hold of it from him. There were some um, uh, virulent viruses that spread very quickly. And then um, there were people who sent floppies uh, in with information on AIDS, and then they actually infected all systems. And. Uh, well, we started to think about the following um, solution. If there is anything, any similarity, between biological and computer viruses. A simulation of a living matter uh, is a thing, but can we find uh, similarities, connections, uh, properties to, to compare the biological viruses with computer viruses? Is there a viable model? And if we did this, then uh, can we draw conclusions? Uh, from which uh, we can uh, we can really learn from uh, human uh, virology. I spent lots of time uh, at the Virological Institute of the Hungarian military. I'm, I did not become a virologist, but I learned a lot about viruses. And for example, I saw the Quran in uh, in real life. And after these studies, uh, we wanted to to compare living uh, viruses, biological viruses, with computer viruses. 
And I must tell you that uh, we found uh, reasonable things, uh, meaningful things uh, for comparison. One thing is that they are extremely small. Uh, a flu virus is, uh, is invisible with the naked, to the naked eye. And the MS-DOS uh, average size was 25 bytes, 25,000 bytes. And the virus was something like 31 bytes from 1,000 bytes. So they, these are small. And if, if you really just uh, uh, calculate uh, interpreter programs, then we, we go up into the region of 100,000. Um, both viruses can only live in a given environment. If a hepatitis virus uh, is taken, then a dog uh, won't have any problem with it. Uh, but Babesia virus doesn't do anything to cats, which is uh, life-threatening for dogs. But the same is true for computer viruses, because there is one instruction set for PC, there is one command set for MS-DOS, and the functional uh, system is the same, and uh, it is possible to write uh, uh, viruses for MS-DOS environment, but they will be two separate code, and it can only live on in this environment. Biological virus is a, a DNA chain. And um, if something is infected, if an organism is infected, then it will just change a part of the cells of the infected organism. And uh, whenever the cell is, uh, is proliferated, then we will just spread the virus. The same happens uh, in the computer. If a program is uh, considered as a cell, then due to the infection, the program is forced to spread the virus. And then it will deal with the functional part of its um, task. Uh, both exploits its own environment. It's quite natural and it comes uh, uh, from the microscopic properties. A biological virus uh, cannot really go and uh, do things and breathe because then they would leave uh, traces behind that the man would uh, immediately notice. Uses those functionality, bios functionality, uh, it doesn't have a disk control part. It uh, encrypts something and then asks BIOS and uh, records something and, uh, and uh, infects the whole system. There is a very important uh, thing. Uh, both of them are uh, undetectable by our uh, sense, senses uh, of uh, perception. And the computer itself cannot perceive it. And there is also an important thing, and this is incubation, latency, latency or incubation. So all the malicious uh, program uh, looks like a bullet or a narrow, uh, more like a bullet or a narrow, which causes uh, immediate uh, uh, problem, which causes uh, immediate harm. But viruses always have incubation, and they would like to proliferate. And for this, they need a real incubation time. They should uh, be hidden from the naked eye of the observer, and this is incubation. This is what we get hold of, to, to, to really just get hold of the incubation, to notice it in time. Well, what would happen if uh, the, the human organism uh, were noticed from the moment when it is uh, infected? Uh, our society uh, would have built uh, uh, little, uh, little uh, quarantine, quarantines uh, in the street, and and other people would just step in, but and they would very immediately stop um, uh, the proliferation of uh, the spreading of an epidemic. So, what comes out? Uh, if I could re reduce the incubation time to zero, then 
one given machine, one given program can be eradicated from the system without uh, without um, letting the epidemic spread. It won't be any uh, computer-related death as it happened in 1986. We learned from the biological viruses, and due to our learning, uh, we thought that we were in a lucky situation because we exactly uh, know how a program should look like, or what a program should look like. Well, why can't we immunize this program? Because we can write codes uh, that uh, would check uh, the first instructions of the program, uh, takes it, whatever it finds here, puts it itself at the end of the program, says the program to start with this, uh, checks uh, if uh, everything is clean behind it, and if there is something there, then he will just delete it. Cut it out, put it, puts it back to the beginning of the paste it back to the beginning of the program, and the program is solved. The virus is killed. At the same time, of course, uh, they may tell the operator that there was some uh, some uh, swindling, some mischief here. This solution uh, wasn't really lucky because there were codes that protected themselves. Uh, which uh, had some control number uh, algorithm, and they didn't tolerate immunization. And it actually produced a placebo effect uh, on the users. And if everything is immunized here, then uh, they didn't deal, deal with the messages uh, in a given case. At the same, same time, we learned the whole thing uh, uh, as we have learned from the viruses how to do it. Other virus detectors uh, may mistake it for a virus. The self-defense part may mistake it for a virus because uh, uh, they contain illegal instructions or um, semi-illegal or unusual uh, instructions that even a, a beginner heuristic algorithm, heuristic algorithm would regard as a virus, but we minimized incubation time, radically minimized incubation time. Those systems where uh, similar solutions were used, and not only viruses were uh, looked for, uh, they couldn't uh, completely fail uh, because they gave uh, warning uh, much beforehand, much before that. I don't know if it occurred to, to, to you, but I never mentioned the name of this or that viruses, uh, like Friday 13 and so on. Now I am speaking about the viruses in general, and this is a change of philosophy. Uh, so we shouldn't find computer viruses. I'm not interested in flu A, B, C uh, virus when I have flu. One thing is important, health, being, uh, being or staying healthy. And at that time, we believe that we can really achieve this. The last slide of the presentation, the last part of the, of the presentation, we'd like to share with you a solution which uh, operated, functioned, and then it was lost. That's the lost solution. Many firms started to find out a hardware-based solution. Uh, simply because uh, no software solution survived uh, the hand of Gabor Andridi or Segedi, uh, either their hands or their wit. We could really switch it off or turn it around if there was a hardware device. There was one thing that we could do, and many of us uh, attempted this to do. Um, we prepare the hardware uh, device that cannot be switched off uh, only if you just dismount the whole uh, machine. The basics of the whole thing is, is as follows. We should really grab all kind of knowledge and opportunity to, to check our programs. What happens uh, uh, with the scanner softwares existing all over the world? Uh, we should try to determine what kind of compiler it was used, Borland, C, C++, and so on. So if a code starts as it was translated or uh, compiled by lattice C, then we can say it's clean. Uh, 
we should do our best. Uh, we should use all the resources. And then uh, as soon as we know how uh, the starting environment should be checked of a program, then we should store unique identifiers of the program. Not as we did in the case of self-defense, we should really take it off from the shoulder of self-defense and we should store it in it in a database or any storage device. Third thing, very important, we should install a small module in each PC that oversees BIOS I operations, BIOS bootloading, DOS file operations, application launches. And let's say that the results uh, can be given by programs that have a real classification, registration, unknown programs cannot enter the system and cannot run without classification. Our check programs cannot run even if they are clean. Often they contain viruses. What happens if we failed to recognize the virus? Uh, the answer is nothing. Why? Imagine you have 100 programs. Assume this, and uh, all of them have some some um, uh, characteristic feature. And the 101st is uh, infected. We we try to evaluate it, classify it. We check the the entering entry environment of the virus. It will start. One is infected out of the 100. Will it start? No. Uh, we will get a warning. Uh, uh, incubation time is zero, and there is only one program which was affected which seem to be okay and uh, uh, there is one in the infected one which seems to be bad but um, but if we classify it then it, it is identical with the one that seems to be good we can use it for analytical reasons so there was an automaton of comparison uh, the objective was not to find the virus, but to keep the whole thing healthy. Somebody may say that this is hardware and, and very expensive. Uh, no. Uh, at that time, on every Ethernet car, card or board had a remote, uh, remote bootleg. And then um, it was just built in, remote EEPROM. And what was the consequence around 95, 96? Many companies, hospitals, secondary schools, which is a very uh, dangerous area, and uh, not even a single virus uh, could uh, destroy uh, a big epitome. We could catch certain viruses, but um, hardware developed, Windows came, and the whole world came to a standstill. Thank you very much for your attention. And there is one question. Maybe I will be the person today who will ask you a very ugly question. These are the prices for these things. And we mentioned boot virus. Can anyone tell me what, what are in the last two uh, by, why is the last two bytes uh, 55 AA for a boot sector? Why it is 55 AA in hex for the two last bytes content? That's the content of every boot uh, boot part. We know that it is 55 AA, but why? Why? What's the the use of this? End of a boot sector, 55AA, no, 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 no. Another attempt. Calibration, no. Uh, this is something much farther away. Yeah, and I was just consulting myself if I really should dare to ask this. May I give you the answer? You know that. Uh, at the beginning, there were 8-bit computers, Commodore and Z80 and so on, and Spectrum. And IBM decided that he will do a big machine in which there will be 640 kilobytes of memory, active operative um, memory, and the rest. Uh, 
was used for the video, the BIOS, and, uh, and uh, everything else. XTs uh, were made of one bit memory chips. That is, a memory module had nine chips next to one another, and in each, uh, each and every, there was 64 kilobit. And the whole thing was constructed, and uh, the reason why 55A is the last one, because the uh, the BIOS uh, 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 must be loaded within one existing chip, and the uh, likelihood that the memory chip will fail uh, instead of turning everything around, and even the parity bit is false, and then the next uh, line in it uh, will just fail in the opposite direction, then the likelihood is 2 to the mm, power of minus huge number. And this is the reason why uh, 55AE are the last two bytes contents.